We turn now to our interview with Patti Smith. Patti Smith, it's great to have you back in the studios of Democracy Now! You were here to inaugurate the studios a few oh, years ago. I'm so ago. happy to be back, Amy. So, you won um, the National Book Award for Just Kids, and we'll get to that. But we want to start with the new book, Thank M you. Train. Now, a lot of people in New York ride the M train, but that's not <laughs> what you're talking about with M train. Well, not really. Um, mine is the M train that I perpetually ride. It's more for mental train, uh, mind train. It's the, it's we all have it, you know, our continual train of thought. People think of you as a musician. Um, uh, when you write, which you actually have to do for lyrics as well, but when you s write, do you sit down to write? What? How do you compose a book like Just Kids or M Train? Well, I'm always writing, and uh, I, I mean, I'm. I, I always counsel people when they call me a musician. I really um, do not have the. Uh, um, the skills of a musician. I really don't think like a musician, though I love music and I perform and sing. I can't really play anything, but m the music that I do have within me goes directly through the word. And um, when I'm writing lyrics, I'm uh, writing uh, in regard to and respect to the composers of the music sometimes myself, but usually someone like Lenny Kay or Tony Shanahan, my or my daughter. Um, so I'm really um, infusing my words with, with their music, into their music. But when I'm writing a book, I don't have any responsibility uh, to anyone. I'm solitary. I'm writing on my own. I, I write by hand, and— um, I, I write every day. I mean, it's, it's part of my daily discipline. But I, I think that uh, the, my love of music and my love of poetry somehow finds its rhythms in my prose, hopefully, I, I think. And it's very striking about um, M Train. You say uh, at the opening of the book that you were actually writing about nothing. And it's also, in terms of its narrative, very different from just kids. So could you talk about the experience of writing both and what you intended with one and the other? Well, when I say nothing, it was really because uh, I had no agenda, no plot, no outline. I had no idea where I was going. It was really, literally, I got on the train. I didn't have a ticket. I didn't have a destination. I just kept going. With Just Kids, I had tremendous amount of responsibility and, um, and a a very classic agenda. Robert Maplethorpe asked me to write our story the day before he died. I had never written a book of nonfiction, and um, so it took me almost two decades to write that book. Uh, that was thinking, gathering my diaries, material, um, going through a period of mourning and finding my voice, and the whole time feeling very responsible to Robert, to the people in the book, I would say most of them who are dead, and, um, and to New York City, which has gone through vast amount of changes since the 60s and 70s. So my, um, my responsibility was profound, chronologically, to make certain that people were re represented properly, even people that I didn't like. I had to find a way to, to treat them respectfully. And um, so it was— uh, For the uninitiated, can you explain who Robert Maplethorpe yes. is, Robert, was, yes. and also <laughs> your relationship with him? Well, Robert Maplethorpe um, I met in 1967. He was a student at Pratt, though even as a student, a fully formed artist. Um, we um, went through many things in our life together. He became my loved one, then my best friend. And Robert became very famous um, posthumously for his uh, some of his more difficult subject matter as a photographer, especially his S and M photography. But all of the work that Robert did, especially the work uh, one could say 
when he um, uh, was treating difficult subject matter was done to elevate his subject to the realm of art. So Robert was really the artist of my life. And uh, it's funny, because I still consider him with me. It's very hard for me still to talk about Robert in past tense, but um, we were so close. And at the end of his life, he, he did want to be remembered. He was on the cusp of notoriety. Um, and he knew that he trusted me, and he knew that I would uh, represent him well. You mentioned that it took two decades for you to write Just Kids, and that you went through a period of mourning. And a number of people have pointed out that your work seems to be haunted by loss and by mourning. Could you talk about the relationship between writing your artistic creation and loss? Well, I don't feel that my work is haunted. I don't feel haunted. I feel that I walk with the people that I've lost, and I would be sad not to have them with me. I would rather feel the sorrow of, uh, that sometimes I have of not having my husband or my brother or Robert or other friends than not feeling them at all. And um, but I found that writing, it's it's almost like you you um, you make you you make these people flesh again. You bring them back in a way that other people can know them and know them as a human being. I mean, you know, writing just kids. I didn't write it to be for a cathartic. Is that the right word? Experience mm -hmm. for me. I really wrote it because Robert asked me to. But I also wrote it so that people would know Robert um, as a human being and not merely a young man who took um, notorious pictures who died of AIDS. Um, nothing wrong with that description, but he there was um, there was a lot of backstory, a lot of uh, the story of how what he sacrificed to be an artist, you know, and I wanted people to know him. What did he sacrifice? Well, I think all artists sacrifice um, a certain amount of just daily life, unfettered. I can't imagine what it would be like not to spend a large por portion of my day uh, writing, transforming. I can never relax. I think that's what artists sacrifice in a certain way. I go to the opera and I'm rewriting the opera. You know, I'm uh, listening to um, a beautiful passage of Schubert and I'm writing lyrics to it in my head. Sometimes I wish I could just, you know, be, you know, a, just a person who could one to one appreciate things as they are, but always the artist is seeking to transform and to. Um, create new ways of looking at something. Patty Smith, for the hour, talking about her new book, M Train, also Just Kids, for which we, she won the National Book Award, about her relationship with the photographer Robert Maplethorpe, her evaluation of the Obama administration, climate change, and much more. Stay with us. Eyes is just another skin simply slips away you can rise above it it will shed easily it all will come out fine I've learned it line by line one coming wire You can hide in the open a 
just disappear. It all will come out fine. I've learned it line by line. Won't come in one Grateful, year. performed by Patti Smith, as we spend the hour with the great poet, writer, activist, musician. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman, with Nermeen Shea. We continue our conversation with Patti Smith, the legendary poet, singer, author and activist. She's just published a new memoir titled M Train. It's a follow-up to her best-selling memoir, Just Kids, which won a National Book Award in 2010. Just Kids is about you and Robert Maplethorpe. Did you start M Train to talk about your husband, Fred Sonic Smith, or to focus more on him? In, in 94, you lost both him and your dear brother, Todd Smith, who was your road manager, band manager, and everything, within weeks. I never No, I, um, I'm doing another book, my next book, which I know what it's going to be already, will greatly focus on Fred and my brother. I never planned to write about my brother and Fred in this book. I really wanted to be free of, of any expectation. I wanted to write—I knew I wanted to write about the process of writing. Um, I wanted it to be sort of a more humorous book um, and just, you know, write about daily life. And uh, But they kept seeping in. Fred kept—he just kept entering. I mean, I never wrote so much about Fred since he's passed away. He's always with me, but I do haven't been able to write about him. I just couldn't bear it. He just found his way in, in this book. But it, what's unusual is the next book was not going to speak of this period of our life. So it, it just it just happened. And it, it, it happened so many times. I'd write and I'd even shelve something, and then later he would come back. So I thought, well, he wants to be within the pages, so— um, Can you tell us about Fred, how you met? I met Fred um, at uh, Lafayette Coney Island. It's a place where they sell hot dogs in Detroit. I met him on March uh, 9, 1976, and they threw a party. I, I didn't like parties much when I was younger. I used to feel confined at them, and I would always say, don't don't throw me some party. So they, they, they lured me, because I like hot dogs, by having an afternoon party in Detroit. So I thought, OK, I'll get some hot dogs. And then all the local musicians were there. So I ate my hot dog, and I was just about to leave. I was with Lenny Kay, and this fellow was standing. He had a blue overcoat on, and he was just standing against the radiator right near the door. And I looked at him. I didn't know who he was. He looked at me, and I swear to you, um, I thought, that's the fellow I'm going to marry. I don't know why that happened. It was an instant moment of alchemy. And I did marry him. And um, Who was this fellow? Well, he was—his um, name was Fred, and um, his nickname was Fred Sonic Smith. He was in the MC5, which was one of the most, you know, political bands to come out of Detroit. They played at the—in um, in Chicago in 68. Uh, um, they, they were involved in a lot of uh, uh, different—a uh, lot of protests against the Vietnam War. Um, but I didn't—I didn't know much about them. I didn't know he was that fella. I just knew that this human being in front of me was the person for me. And Lenny Kay introduced us, and he said, Patty Smith, Fred Smith, Fred Smith, Patty Smith. And neither of you would have had to change your names if no, you got married. No, we didn't. We didn't. Uh, as some people said, you know, the, the uh, monogram towels didn't have to be, as if either one of us had <laughs> monogram towels. But, um, we had a long courtship, a long-distant courtship, and because uh, he lived in Detroit, I lived in New York, and finally in '79, I, I thought I, I didn't want to be parted from him anymore, so I went and lived in Detroit. 
Is it true he said to you, I will take you anywhere in the world if you just have my baby? He actually said um, um, he wanted a son, and he said, uh, to be democratic, I said child, but he asked for a son, and I said, okay. And, um, and he took me to French Guiana, because that's where I chose, and I did have a son. And then a little time went by, and he said, now I'd like a daughter. <laughs> and I said, okay. And uh, that took a little longer, but we had our daughter. So um, he, uh, I'm so glad he asked to, because my children are the most precious thing that I have. Could you just tell us about Guiana, why you chose Guiana and what you did there? <laughs> well, I think that Fred, when he said that he would take me anywhere in the world, figured I'd want to go, you know, to Paris or— The you know, Riviera. Or, well, not the Riviera, <laughs> but see, Rumpo. he knew that I would pick something slightly eccentric or, you know, go visit, uh, you know, Arthur Rimbaud's grave in Charville or something. But um, I had done that, so I chose— um, Saint Laurent in French Guiana because I really love Janae and Janae in I think um, I think it's the Thieves Journal or I can't remember which Explain book it is. Who Jean Genet is Jean Genet of um, one of our the great French uh, writers of the 20th century who uh, really um, um, who was you know not a not a very good thief but a great poet and uh, prose writer and wrote of uh, marginalized society um, in the 20, 20th century, the 40s and the 50s, and a great playwright. And um, um, I chose French Guiana because Jean Genet always wanted to go to Saint Laurent pr prison. He was very romantic. All of the murderers and the pimps and the, the worst of the, the thieves all went to French Guiana, and it was a terrible place. Everyone died of, of malaria or piranha, and, uh, but he wanted to go because he was a great romantic, and he wanted to go with the worst criminals. But just as he was sent to prison um, for life, for thievery, um, they closed the prison down. And he never got there. And he mourned that. He wrote about it several times. He stole he, for nothing? <laughs> he had actually—he actually said, I, I have been shorn of my infamy, because he could never go. And then I knew that he was ill. And I hadn't met him, but I, of course, knew William Burroughs and Allen Ginsberg and Gregory Corso. I knew his friends. And I thought, I was going to go to French Guiana and get something from the earth of French Guiana for him, bring him back some of the soil, bring him back some stones, so he would have that. And then I thought, well, William or someone could give them to him. And so I told Fred this, and Fred didn't mock me, he didn't uh, protest. He was a man true to his word, and he said, all right, we'll go to French Guiana. So we did. You went to prison there? We went to prison, yeah. <laughs> Jean Genet is also—one of his books, um, called uh, Prisoner of Love, was published posthumously, in which he wrote about his meetings with the Black Panthers here in the U.S., and also his visits to um, Palestinian refugee camps in Jordan. Yes. Could you talk about that book, and also, more broadly, uh, what you see as the relationship between that kind of art and politics? Well, I think that Jean Genet, in his early life, he— um, he mixed uh, his sexual encounters, his, uh, his homosexual persuasion, um, um, uh, thieves and murderers. He melded all of that into, into art and, um, and elevated uh, the, these characters in his work. And as he, um, as he got older, he got very, very involved in political causes. Um, he was especially um, concerned with the plight of the Palestinians. And I think that in the, the toward the end of his life, he wanted to do the same with with these people, elevate them, not as uh, you know, outlaws or 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 terrorists or marginal marginalized people, but people that had 
a, a true cause and people that needed um, to be represented and spoken for. And, um, and so he worked on this book at the end of his life. He, at the end, when he died, he had just finished the galleys on Prisoner of Love. It was, he uh, died in a little Paris hotel and that manuscript was sitting uh, on the bedstand. And, um, and it's also, you know, it's a very beautiful book, not just because of the political element, but it's beautiful because uh, Janae was never uh, one to sympathize much with women. Um, and but the, the strongest char um, I shouldn't say characters because um, uh, it's a nonfiction book. But the, str the the people that emerge the strongest in this book are are the women, the women who are left behind in war, the women who wind up taking care of the children, then the grandmothers taking care of the grandchildren, and uh, you know the strength and resilience of the women. And I, I thought that was quite beautiful for him to do at the end of his life.